Good morning, Capital City. Uh, have you guys ever had expectations, right? We all have expectations. Some of you may have had expectations to see Pastor Rick this morning, and I am not Pastor Rick, so I apologize. I'm very sorry to, uh, to not meet that expectation. I said that in first service, and I picked up this table, and all the legs fell off over there. I had an, a different expectation of this table. Um, so anyways, I mentioned Pastor Rick. Uh, he and Joy are in Arkansas uh, this weekend here, um, and their granddaughter, Emery, turned two this last week. Her birthday party is actually today. They're likely tuning in right now on our live stream. And uh, so yeah, Pastor Dan and I today will be bringing the message on God's promise. So speaking of ex expectations, um, we have expectations. We put expectations on people. We have situations where we have expectations and expectations aren't always met. Uh, I think of uh, my Christmas list with this. As far as I'm concerned, a Christmas list is a contract, right? I put things on the list. I give the link, the coupon code, the dates when the sales are happening, and I have expectations, right? Like, this is a promise. You're going to get me things on the list. I tell you even like, hey, here's the dealership that sells this truck. Here's the, right? Like, there's expectations. And so, um, but you get to Christmas morning and you open this box and uh, there's a patent leather wallet instead of Hulk hands like you asked for, right? Like we don't always, our expectations aren't always met. So as we talk about a promise here, I'm curious about our expectations um, on God's promise. Is God's promise to make life problem-free? Has he promised to make your holidays problem-free, to make your family perfect, to make troubles disappear? Is that something that he has promised? Well, obviously not. That's me being kind of a goofball there with that. It is not something that God has promised. So we're going to take a look here at what this promise is we're covering today. It's from Matthew chapter 21, and this is about the, uh, or Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 is where I'm starting. This is about the, the birth of Jesus. And so this is the angel speaking to Joseph, and the angel says, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So as we look at trying to apply God with us today, sometimes that feels kind of tough. How do we apply this? So to get us kind of in the right mindset, I want you guys to think of the biggest thing you're facing right now. It could be family, work, uh, health, finances. We all have something, something big, something that pops into our mind. As you guys think of that thing, as that pops into your mind, I wanna ask you, what's the next thing that pops into your mind? I know for me, the next thing is my expectations, my plan, my solution. It's interesting to me, in this story here, in Matthew chapter one, a couple verses earlier, Joseph even had his own plan. And we'll see this here in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Joseph had expectations. Joseph, when those expectations weren't met, Joseph formulated his own plan. He had a plan. He was a good guy and he was going to do this properly, but he had his own plan. Again, this isn't the first time throughout scripture that we see people making their own plans. Um, we know all the way back to the Garden of Eden, um, God was with Adam and Eve, and sin broke that relationship. And God never gave up on his plan, but we see time and time again through the Old Testament where humans, where people, where we are creating our own plans to accomplish what we want. Um, 
And so we'll look here. I, this was something as I was kind of looking at this, the, the next section here. There's two names in this. Um, you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And then they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And that reminds me of the garden. In the garden, we sinned, and it broke that relationship to where God was no longer with us in the same way there. Again, God's plan never has changed. God's plan was to send his son to redeem us, to offer means to restore that relationship. So for us today, what does it mean to have God with us? Sometimes it sounds like just an empty Christian platitude. It's the thing you say at Christmas time, right? Emmanuel, we sing songs about it. Um, but it's interesting to me again that we really only see and hear this name around Christmas time. We talk about Jesus all year long, right? But we talk about Emmanuel at Christmas time. So is this something that applies outside of Christmas? So as I was uh, looking into this and reading, I like the history. I want to look and see um, where did this come from. And so the name Emmanuel we see three times in Scripture, twice in Isaiah, and then here in Matthew where um, Matthew quotes Isaiah. It's from Isaiah chapter 7, and if you guys go and read that, um, what you'll see there is King Ahaz, uh, there was a war, the enemy was at the gate, the king is scared, the nation trembled like a leaf is how scripture describes it. And God came to Ahaz through the prophet Isaiah and wanted to comfort him, wanted to encourage him, spoke to these individual things. There is a war, the enemy is at the gate. I know you're scared. I know your heart trembles like a leaf, but God said, I'm with you and you need to stand firm in your faith. Now. The trouble for King Ahaz was God's timeline. God told him 65 years and these enemy, this enemy will be no more. I'm sure looking at that, I mean, for even me, I turned 40 in February. In 65 years, I'm not probably going to be around at 105, right? God, your time, this isn't my time, right? Um, also, God had promised to King David that there would always be a member of his family on the throne. And Ahaz was a member of his family. This warring nation outside the gates of Jerusalem wanted to remove him from the throne. And is God going to keep that promise? Is God going to hold up his end? I have expectations, right? That's like likely what Ahaz is thinking in this. So God, to show him, offers a sign. He tells him, you can pick anything. As high as heaven, as low as the place of the dead. And... You guys, you pick anything you want. The king refused though, saying that he wouldn't test God. I'm not gonna test God, right? I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna ask for a sign. The reality though, what we see is he had more faith in his circumstances than he had in God's promise to be with him. Have you guys ever experienced something that felt like it was bigger than God? Your circumstances were bigger? You didn't see how God was going to get you through this. Um, it's a real thing that we can struggle with. Sometimes um, we can act like we have faith, but the reality is we avoid the actions of faith, of trusting God, of standing firm. So the prophet Isaiah, that's where we get to this prophecy. Here in Isaiah 7, uh, verse 14. All right, then. The Lord himself will give you the sign. This is Isaiah's response after the king refused. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So all of the theologians, everybody that's smarter than I am, uh, they, there's a, a lot of discussion about that. This was likely there was a, a woman and a baby and a fulfillment of this that Isaiah saw take place. But Matthew draws this connection to Jesus for us, that this is God's promise to be with us through Jesus. So if Jesus didn't come to make us comfortable and trouble-free, then what does it mean to have God with us? Jesus came to be with us in relationship, in the midst of our troubles, in the midst of these hard times, 
He wants to be with us, to walk with us through these things. For some of you, you may have stories that you think of. You may have something that's a reminder of that, of God being with you in a hard time. And if you don't, I want to share a story here. I want to personalize this for you. And hopefully my story will encourage you and can be a step towards building your faith. As a family, when we face some of these times, we ask ourselves, what would a good and loving God do in this situation? Because the reality is that's the place we have to start from. God, you are good and loving, and I know you have a plan and you have a purpose for this time, for this situation. So... For me, my story, if you guys don't know, I um, grew up here in Des Moines, grew up in a Christian home, but I grew up in a home where I feared my dad. I physically feared him. I feared his hands. I feared his words. I was afraid. Um, he didn't feel like a father. He didn't feel like a mentor. He didn't feel um, like a protector he felt often like an enemy. Um, in 2009, he was arrested and tried. Uh, in 2010, he was sentenced. And I, all of a sudden, felt some peace. God, you're with me. The enemy is distant, out of sight, out of mind. Lord, thank you for this peace. Thank you for freeing me from this. And for a while, that's what I felt, and that's what I believed. Uh, coming out of the pandemic, about 10 years later, um, there were rumbles of a early release. Fall of 2021, that took place. He was released, and um, we found out in the beginning part of 22 that he actually moved into this neighborhood right here near the church. And I asked God, why? Why is the enemy at the gate? Why aren't you protecting me? Why don't you care about my peace of mind? Why is this happening? God, I have expectations. My plan is to never have to see this guy again. So this summer um, in August, I had a friend I ran into, knows our family, knows the story. And he mentioned to me, hey, I don't know if you've heard this or not. Your dad's in the hospital and he's probably not going to make it. And he even tried to kind of position it like this was good news, almost like soon the enemy will be no more. And I found myself asking, questioning, is this who I am? God, is this who I am? Do I want you to take a life to preserve my peace of mind or what I would call peace of mind? Um, I started wrestling wrestling right then and there with the Lord, I knew God was doing something. I knew he was with me and he was working, but I didn't know if I wanted it. I knew right away, God had put it on my heart that I need to speak to him again. I um, yeah, wrestled a couple of weeks, wrestled with this. Finally got to September 7th was, was the day where I finally said to the Lord, I'm ready. I'm saying yes. And you're going to show me the time, you're going to show me the place, and I'm going to say yes. I had told Pastor Dan and Pastor Rick and a couple other guys just for accountability that like, hey, I, here's what I'm saying to the Lord. I want you to check in on me, keep me accountable whenever this happens in the future. Um, so it was Thursday. I was leaving work, driving home here from the church and past my parents here in the neighborhood. I... Uh, I asked God, why? Why today? Um, I said yes, but I'm, I meant yes like later on when it's comfortable for me, when I'm ready, when my plan fits. Um, drove up another block, reluctantly said yes again, turned around and drove back, pulled into the driveway and spoke to my parents for the first time in 14 years. Um, what I realized through that conversation was that God's plan all along was not to rid me of the enemy that I believed I saw. God, 
through that day, keeping my mouth shut of all of the dumb and angry things that I wanted to say that I had built up over the last 14 years, um, God worked a miracle of forgiveness in my heart and showed me that he had been working this miracle uh, over the last several years. And what I realized that day was the enemy God wanted to set me free from was the enemy of fear, the enemy of bitterness, um, the enemy of anger, the enemies that I had not only outside the gate, I had invited inside, I had invited into my heart and had allowed these enemies to take hold. God worked a miracle of forgiveness in my life to truly set me free from my enemies. So as we wrestle with this today, as we wrestle with what does God have for us? How is God with us? I want to encourage you guys that as you think of that biggest thing, as you think of the thing that seems to be looming in front of your eyes in your life, that you ask him to reveal himself to you in that, that you seek him in this situation. Ask um, God, where are you at in this? Reveal yourself to me. Again, starting from the spot of what would a good and loving God have for me in this? So ask him to reveal himself to you. Finally, ask him to walk with you through the coming weeks as you face that thing. So Brian is going to be coming out and singing a song for us, a special here. It's going to be a time of ref reflection for us. As you guys sit and listen to him sing, reflect on those words, spend some time in prayer, seeking God in that biggest thing that you are facing, asking him to reveal himself to you in that, and asking him to walk with you through the coming weeks as you face that thing. Thank you, worship team. That's some good singing. Or as we say down south, singing. All right, I've got a... Fun story. Appreciate uh, Pastor Jared. We're sort of tag team in the thing today, so it's different. But I always um, absolutely am thrilled to hear what God's done in the life of all of our people, especially people I live life with, like Jared. There was well, Pastor, uh, as Jared said, Pastor Rick is uh, gone. They are down uh, having a birthday party of a two-year-old. And speaking of two-year-olds, I am and Lori and I, I should say are parents of boys and grandparents of boys. Our Christmas swish. Can we have a girl? I mean, testosterone floods everything we do. And if you have a boy, you know what goes on at every dinner. I mean, it's boy talk all the time. Can't we have these pretty girls dressed up? No, all boys. And so I can't speak for being a parent or grandparent of girls, but of boys, you know when it gets to that age where they can just take off, you know, they've learned to run and they're just gone. You can't grab them. And you, uh, you get ready for bath time and every boy loves bath time, warm water, tons of toys, bubbles, right? It's great. It's awesome. You get them out of the bath and you towel them off and God help you if you reach for anything and let them go with the door out, the door open, right? So Brady, and he's going to love this as a Missouri state trooper, his whole friend's going to hear this story, but it's a true story. So back in the day, we had this towel. I don't, I'm a guy, I don't remember all the stuff, but you had this little hood and then you would like, you know, bundle them all up and warm them up. And every time with Brady, get him out of the bath, towel him dry, go to do something, and the door's open, he's gone. Towel on the head, almost like a superhero cape behind him, and he's wearing nothing but a smile, and he's making laps in the living room, man, and it doesn't matter who's there. It could be grandparents, it could be family you haven't never seen before, it could be the mailman, but Brady's streaking. He's fine, smile, and nothing else on, and everything's okay. And then to, uh, to reiterate that, we got a picture just a couple weeks ago, literally. We have a little grandson in Dallas, Texas. So, you know, after bath time in Dallas, it's till 75 at night. And uh, Bear is all bear. I mean, he eats with both hands, sometimes no hands. He is, a, he is a bear. And so Bear gets out of the tub and they have a fenced in backyard and they have two dogs. So they leave the back door cracked. And you know where this is going. Bear escapes in the backyard free as a bird, <laughs> nothing but a smile on. It could be neighbors. It could be strangers. It doesn't matter. But um, bear is for all to see. Do we have a pic of, of bear there? I thought there he is. Yeah, little bear. 
bears uh, no inhibition, no fear, no insecurity, no embarrassment. But here's my question. Why? Why is there no insecurity, no fear, no result of consequence? Like it's just so pure. I would suggest it's because they are love completely and perfectly as parents. There's no doubt in their mind. And your next question in your mind is, Dan, what in the world does Emmanuel God with us have to do with streaking boys? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because it starts a couple years ago, like the beginning of time. God creates Adam and they have this close relationship as we read in Genesis 2. He creates Eve, right, to be a helpmate. And I mean, they're naming the animals, right? God creates these things, says, hey, Adam, I want you to name them. They're hanging out. In Genesis 3, it gives us a little bit of a glimpse that um, they could hear God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Like that's the kind of relationship they have. And to validate my illustration, Genesis 2.25, look it up. Adam and Eve were both naked and not ashamed. That's why the illustration, right? But why is that? Again, why were they able to have this such close relationship? Why were they able to be naked and not ashamed? Because that was God's purpose all along, is to have this perfect, close, intimate relationship. And at this point in time, there's no insecurity, no fear, no comparison going on. All we know is like a little, a little child. <laughs> As I know, my mom and dad loves me unconditionally and completely. Therefore, I can strip everything off and just run in the living room or the backyard. That is a person who is fully and absolutely loved. But you and I both know that's not the end of the story. Later on in Genesis 3, God gives them all these things about the garden, things you can do. I mean, it's Eden, it's paradise, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't touch it. And you know they did. They disobeyed God. We call it sin. And from that point, everything changed. It, uh, relationship is not, it's not gone, but it is, let's just say, complex. It's hard. God puts now a system. I call them processes and priests. And it is tough. They're, they're different sacrifices for different sins. And oh, by the way, you can't go to God for that. You have to go to a priest who represents you, who goes to God on your behalf. It's, it's not like it was at the beginning. And, and how do we, I call it real life. How do we know how real life happens? Well, you know, it starts early in school, playground. I remember it. I was probably like six or seven. And unfortunately, I've always been abnormal. I've always been a little taller than everybody else. And I'm super thin and I had 90% legs and I got called giraffe legs. It's not funny. No, I'm kidding. I'm over it by now. But like those things hit us, don't they? Like, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize I had giraffe legs, you know, do I do like that when I drink water? I, you know, all these thoughts start coming through your mind, right? Because all of a sudden that perfect relationship starts to be tainted by bad decisions we make or bad decisions other people make that affect us. So, you know, we get conversations like that. Some of us grew up, you know, and we were struggling with, with acne, right? And we're trying to cover and conceal. And then we start comparing ourselves. We all did that as kids, right? You size each other up. They're big, they're small, they're not, they are. They're, they're really good at singing. They're really good at athletics. And we start to compare ourselves and these lies start to fill our head and unfortunately our heart. There's some things that an adult, right? A parent, as we listen to Jared, a coach, a teacher that said something to us that didn't just land in our head, it, it stayed in our heart. And we can laugh about things that happen in our, you know, 10 and maybe as a teenager in our teen years, like, but it still sticks. I'll never forget the time a 50 year old was telling me of the story in fourth grade. And a teacher says to him in front of the entire class, I don't know if you're stupid or what. And he recites it to me as if it happened yesterday. And he got two degrees, a medical degree and a chiropractic degree because a fourth grade teacher said that. This is part of the broken world, never meant to be. 
And then some of us, I mean, Christmas is here, right? And Christmas is also the highest time of anxiety and depression. We've heard the stats before. And sometimes Christmas, you know, we all are, are wired with this or, or maybe infiltrated this God-shaped void. I mean, we all want what little boys who streak have, that relationship. We all want what Adam and Eve had. We want that unconditional, perfect, uncompromised relationship in love. And if we haven't found that, we fill that up. We fill that up with alcohol, a drug of choice, your app on your phone, all trying to fill the void that God said, I will restore. Matthew says something very interesting in the last part of chapter one. He says to Joseph, hey, you'll name him Jesus because he will take away the sins of the world. And here's the good news. That is what Jesus came to do. He is the Emmanuel, God with us. Where God started out being so close, now we have the separation, this gap. The good news was years later, he makes the promise the Messiah is coming and we celebrate Christmas because God came in the form of Jesus to reestablish, to restore this relationship. It was supposed to be that way from the beginning. He didn't forget this was all a part of his perfect plan. So we talk about Emmanuel, God with us. We celebrate Christmas. Jesus has come, but it's not the end of the story. It's crazy to say this, but three months from now, we'll be celebrating Easter, which also means winter will be over, just saying. But um, Jesus lives a perfect life so he can be the perfect sacrifice. No more blood sacrifices. Jesus is it. He takes on our sin. He He's crucified on a cross. He's buried and God said, no, let me show you the rest of the story. He raises Jesus from the dead to defeat sin, death, and hell once and for all. And now you and I get to have that relationship again. You say, Dan, how? Well, I'm glad you asked. There's a verse in Romans that I talk about and, and it just seems to me to be pretty simple. Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says, for whoever declares the Lord, or with your mouth you declare the Lord is Jesus. You believe that he died on the cross for your sins. You will be saved. Well, what does that mean? What does saved mean? It means Jesus came to forgive and heal and blot out your sin. And it means Emmanuel, God will restore this relationship. It is no longer going to a priest. Now we go directly to God, no matter what's going on in your life. And if you're a person who's wrestling with this relationship, how do we do that? Well, it's called prayer and prayer is talking to God. You can do that out loud. You can literally pray that prayer. We confess with our mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in our heart, God, you raised him from the dead. And you just say, I surrender. Romans 10, 13 is a great little paraphrased version. It says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And it's not like a, just a cry. It's a surrender. God, I give up. I realize what you've done. I want you to come into my life. And you can pray that out loud or you can pray that as Pastor Rick would say, um, you know, it's like typing. You know, you don't talk to type like you're thinking these words and God created us. You can think thoughts, God hears and knows your thoughts and he will communicate back to you. But if you will consider this relationship that God started at the beginning, yes, we know real life happens, but he didn't leave us. God with us is Jesus incarnate who said, listen, I came back to take that gap and make it as close, perfect, complete as possible. So I'd encourage you to pray that prayer, to do business with God as we pray here in a moment. And if you are a follower of Jesus, it's a, it's a sweet time. And you've gone through life and Pastor Jared, his conversation, his illustration, his real life story is true. When Jesus comes into our life, I still recall it, thousands of us recall it, there is something supernatural. There is a peace, and I've heard this every single time that someone has chosen to follow Christ. I hear this phrase, it feels like a yoke or a burden has been lifted off because that is the result of sin. And it's also the gift of God. So as a believer, when we pray that prayer and we've accepted Christ, life goes on. And here's what I want to remind you, just like Pastor Jared reminded us, Jesus loves you and me perfectly. The problem is we have free will. And sometimes I take that baggage with me. 
And it breaks Jesus' heart because he's like, hey, leave the baggage. Leave the hurt and pain. Leave the giraffe legs there. Leave whatever it is that has haunted you there. Come in complete relationship with me. See what this perfect love is like. So my encouragement to you, if you're a follower of Jesus, is just reminded on this Christmas season, (laughs) make sure you don't bring that stuff back into the relationship. Leave that stuff out. Jesus paid the price. The truth he communicates to you through his Bible, through prayer, dispels every bit of that. 1 John 4.18 says this, and it's true. Perfect love cast out all fear. Did you hear that? Perfect love cast out all fear. That's why little boys can streak and have no fear. They are perfectly and unconditionally loved, just like Jesus loves us. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, What a sweet time to be reminded in this Christmas season that you have come to reestablish a relationship. Not just a relationship, but such a perfect, complete, unconditionally loving relationship. So that we might experience what you intended from the very beginning. Lord, and as much as we may think it's not true, we see that in the eyes of children. It is possible. You give us physical illustrations all the time, examples to show us heavenly meanings, and I know that to be true. So Lord, if we've never surrendered our life to you, given our life to you, I pray for those who are wrestling with that at this point in time, that they would just be willing to confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that you raised him from the dead and that makes all the difference in the world. And for my friends, Lord, who are wrestling with just life, as Pastor Jared illustrated, that we would set that stuff aside, that we bring it in by, by our human nature, we bring that hurt with us. But Lord, knowing we have such an unconditionally perfect father who adores us, who created us on purpose for a purpose, would we just be reminded to take those lies and cast them aside. And Lord, just look full into our wonderful Heavenly Father's face. Thank you for being Emmanuel, God, with us. Thank you that Jesus came to save us from our sin. And it's in that name that we pray. Amen.